Uh, so, yeah, exactly. Digital terraforming. Just another buzzword the industry needed, right? Um, <laughs> so, we're going to try to explain what we mean with this. And we, of course, in this case, is Tele2. And since the 8th of October, also come him. Mm. So, we're basically the same company now. Turning us into a full-fledged FMC player. So, this is me. Um, very much, I, I am and see myself as a pragmatic evangelist, API advocate. I've been going to Nordic APIs for quite many years. Um, and I actually have a lot of thanks to reach out to uh, Nordic APIs. Help me and also tell it to you a lot. Uh, and of course, engage digital uh, architect, nerd, entrepreneur, and Star Wars fan. I am the monolith antagonist. I hate monoliths. Uh, and I am the protector of separation and concern at Tele2. Exactly, and I'm Sonny Arvus, um, and I can just line up right to this. I think this whole event and everything we've heard today is exactly the things that we love at Tele2. We want to create reusability, focus on separation mm -hmm. of concern, and that's exactly what we want to talk to you about today as well. So, data transformation, I heard a lot about that uh, so far today, and, and people talking about it, and, and one thing that we all know is that is good. If we just do that, we're going to gain revenue, we're going to be more profitable, and we're going to have a higher market value. So, I mean, all those things are good. I mean, not just mentioning all these things. So, one thing for sure is that digital transformation is awesome. So, why, if it is that good and giving that much revenue, why are we not running on this one? Nothing happens in two years. Well, actually, a couple of people actually moved backwards. That's great, you know? And more people planning for it. So, with this in mind, maybe that should be more effort going into this. So, why is it so hard in this case? Well, life is still going on, right? While doing the transformation, the business will continue having patience as my five-year-old before Christmas. And our competitors won't have the courtesy to wait for us while doing this. And same goes for our customers. And hey, now going out and buying another company, that's even more customers. So doing transformation will be something like doing that in mid-flight. And that is tricky. So don't make digital transformation in New Year's Eve. It is just full with broken promises. So what do we need to do? Well. What about us then? Are we safe? Are we protected from this? Tell it to you. No, not of course. We came up with this humble approach. Digitalize or die. Awesome. I mean, there are nothing in stake here, right? So what does that mean? Well, we had this really cool gang of people, external consultants working on what is this for us. So first thing they came up with is we should become data-driven and excel in analytics capabilities. Yeah, well, anyone could do. Go out and buy Hadoop or something. I don't know. So next order of business is implement digital culture and thinking across the organization. Mm. Yeah, okay. As that's not done overnight, right? How do you implement culture? Seriously. But it, get, but it gets better, though. Yeah, well, of course, the final thing that made us all go bananas was, of course, we only now have to secure a state-of-the-art IT environment. For me as an architect and working with this for quite many years, this is, uh, this is quite painful to listen to. Because I know what this is all about, right? Because we're going to have to do shitload of things. And in between all this, in the middle, in the focal point, we will have Omni. Omni is not a beautiful word. It's filled with pain. <laughs> Everything needs to be one thing. You can, of course, try to build Omni by aligning all your channels in the right way, doing exactly the same thing. And you will get stuck in integration for the coming 20 years or something. Or you could go on one solution, sort of a Lord of the Ring approach, right? One solution to rule them all. Well, that has its perks, but also the cons. So, of course, we went on the last thing. I mean, seriously, 
at our walls that our company says, Ingen means in Fegis. So hey, why not? So we went for that. With the knowing of one thing, to achieve this, we need to create something highly flexible that would cope with the things that stands in front of us. Which is essentially what we then did, is that, well, I mean, yes, it's a bit crazy to state these things and to try to do them, but we can actually use it, though. It's a great opportunity, because you do get every chance that you could possibly ask for in order to create something great. And I think we did that, and we took that opportunity. And that's the journey we want to take you through. So we focused on divide and conquer, and it's something about separation of concern, like we've been talking about all day to some degree. Because I like how this event turned more into architecture as well, in that sense. So what we want to do is we want to structure things, right? We don't want to have a big mess of things. We want to structure things so that we have our capabilities. We want to uh, package those capabilities in things that we can expose, that people can use. We want to give some instructions on how to use them, and then expose them through our different channels, regardless of what that is. Simple, right? I mean, in essence, it's really that simple. You organize your stuff, make it into nice packages, give some instructions how to use them, and then there you go. So in essence, what this comes down to a bit is that, well, the things on the, on the left here, they are very reusable. But just having these tiny Lego pieces, you don't really know how to put them together or what to make of them, so they're not really relevant. I mean, if I just give you a bunch of Lego pieces, you're just going to look at it and be like, well, great. Like, OK, they're reusable, but now what? So we need to also make it relevant. And the relevant is rather based on what you want to use it for. right? And in a sense, a lot of this comes down to Make it taking something complex, something that's a bit chaotic and hard to understand, and breaking it down into more less complicated things and even simple things. We want to put them into perspective and separate concern. But not everything we can do, though, uh, in this way. So a lot of things also are just purely chaotic in a way that this isn't even a complex problem. We just don't even know what we're trying to do. And this is the thing that happens all the time, especially in the digital businesses, is and that if, we try to... If you work with Tele2 or work with Tele2, you know that we normally spend our time in this picture. Yeah, we create all sorts of interesting things. Like, and maybe they're great, but I don't, I don't even know what some of these things are. Like that thing on the left, maybe it's fantastic, but I wouldn't even know what, how to break this down into anything. So we need to create some more structure. And then if you look about, okay, so what is reusability really about? It's, it's about breaking things down so that they become simple and small, um, preferably, they should also not understand how they're being used, so it's by up to the one who's using it to determine what makes it relevant. And they should preferably also be very standardized, using open standards or other things, so that they can be highly reusable. But if they're that highly reusable, then it's also, I need to do something with it to make it relevant, because just having reusability isn't really good enough. So on the other hand, you have you need to make it relevant. It needs to suit you in your situation, in your context, with your customers, with your channels. You need to consider everything. And that's very complex. And that's, in essence, this, this balance we need to find is how do we get to this part where it's relevant, where we have something that suits us, we can understand it clearly, we have transparency, we have the right developer and user experience in order to make it useful, and we also make it reliable, because otherwise it's still not really relevant. So, what we did then is we started thinking about, OK, so reusable things, they should be quite stable, not change often. And the relevant things, they often change all the time. Because whatever is relevant is depending on pretty much every situation, which just constantly changes. So what we did was we, we tried to divide this in a way that the things that change often and are harder to predict, we put up in our stack. And the things that are more predictable and change less often, we push down. And that looks roughly like this. We created a layered architecture out of this, in the sense that things that change often is basically everything that's directly facing your customers and your users. They want different things all the time. We need to change things often. And we don't even know, really, what's going to get the desired outcome. So we need to try things out and throw them away again and uh, reinvent them. But the further down we come, like all the way down to network, I mean, that's a different kind of complicated. But there it's predictable. And there we know what we're going to be doing. So what we did, basically, is that we split all of our functionality across these layers in a way that we can deal with one problem at a time in that layer, in a way that the layer below does also not understand what the one is doing. For example, our user and brand capabilities, they don't know which channel is using them, in the same way that uh, the services you built your APIs from, they don't really know who's consuming them in that sense either. 
So this is what our layered architecture looks like. I'm not going to go talk about all of this, but in essence, on the bottom, we have the network, and then all the way on the top, we have what is facing our end customers. And we created this layered architecture. This is the digital part of that, um, where we have our channels on the top, where we provide things in our web shops, in retail, uh, through a customer service. You can do it yourself. You can do it through a partner. Uh, or even we have other partners directly just using our services. And these services, in essence, are what we provide to the uh, outside world. And then we have a lot of different capabilities that they're built from. And these also we can break down into smaller components that become more and more reusable the further down we go. And in a sense, that, that's where the APIs live, really. They are the services that we are providing to our different channels and that we do in a way so that uh, it doesn't matter, really, if it's the partner or on one of our own channels or anything that's using it. They all share that same reusability. And the other part about what works really well with this layered architecture is that in any layer, you can introduce new core services. You can recombine them with the things you already had, add some other more contextual things, and then expose it through new APIs and integrate it with the rest of your stack. So you can grow things in within each layer, but also across layers at the same time. And it's that kind of parallelism that you want so that you can focus on many different things in parallel in a bounded context. So in essence, um, we also need to be able to support this in a good way. So we have a large focus, of course, on having our overall DevOps in place, our site reliable engineering in the sense that we have everything in place so that these people on the right side can focus on building their capabilities and not having to worry about all these other things. And the technology we use in that sense is quite large. We use many different technologies. But these are things that we pick based on what fits best in each of these layers. So in the top, we use lots of different types of front-end technologies, but also caching and other types of frameworks. And we have chosen to focus a lot on Azure. But in essence, from an architecture perspective, this could just be AWS or anything else. Architecturally, these things are completely separated, but they do work together. And this is really the sort of mindset we've had, is that the systems and technology are not the focus point. It's rather how they act and how they relate to each other that is that matters. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So systems, for us, not that super important. Frameworks, standards are though. Yes. So much. back to the thing. Digitalize or die, right? OK, that was three years ago. So I assume we are equally good as many of the previous slides. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, in, in a way, we actually were. It took us quite some time. And we, not just until recently, start moving in, in a really good implementation direction, starting off last year, actually, only. So we managed to plan our work quite well, seriously. But we didn't really start off very well on working the plan. And why was that? Well, in our opinion, we had a good sort of framework on this. We had a guide on how to build things in a reusable way where everything fits. And driven with microservices and all that stuff, why didn't this magic come across? Well, apparently, there are people doing this. Architecture isn't really any valuable if people are not building accordingly. So what we had to do then was start over and say, OK, good, we have architectures, check. We have technologies, check. So now, and we do have people as well, check, but we actually need to start organizing. So we actually start reorganizing ourselves into actually organizing according to our architectural patterns. So we start off with a bunch of cross-functional teams. On top, we had our user experience teams. So we divided them into the user experience. Again, not system-wise. They are working from the user journeys. They join, use, get help, and orientation. For them to actually make some magic, we need to create their accessibilities on the services to use. Simple and reusable. And down below, we need to start creating capabilities. Again, simple, reusable, with low context. So we have commerce, self-care, and identity, and a bunch of other. And to help out, we have our ER squad and SRE. SRE stands for Service Reliability Engineering. That is our sort of Google approved approach to DevOps. Uh, and Emergency Rescue is out to help. They are not the bug squad, though. <laughs> but at our company, we actually have three brands, right? And uh, 
you all know them, quite famous. So we have Teletu Residential, Convic, and Teletu Business. So we had to actually create three different tribes with their own journeys. And to do so, we actually need to get our integration teams same, to actually be better suited for actually each and every channel. So this is what it started to look like. We got now four tribes dealing with millions of users. Still, didn't fully solve the problems. Okay, that was my cue, right? <laughs> okay, sorry guys, tough crowd. <laughs> okay, be nice. So, again, you remember the context here, same as we do with architecture, we try to do with people. So, on top we have complicated problems, or complex problems, right? The user journey is quite complex. Uh, and we try to break that down into several different complicated challenges into our services that make this user journey come true. And we build those services upon our microservices, which are actually, whatever uh, the speaker said, quite simple. Because that's the point of having a micro service. The clue is in the title. It should be small. Don't make SOA. We tried that. It didn't work. So we have not that big of reusability up there, but we have high relevance. Further down you go, high reusability. And this is what happened. So did it work? Well, this was the idea on how it should work. And actually now, sort of is. So UX comes with, user experience comes with their needs. And more or less, 30% of their existing services can actually cover for that. 70 might be creating new or modify existing ones. Further down you go, where the service places its needs, you have a much higher reusability. So now I go borderline 50-50, depending on the cases and how much sort of diversity we are going for, but in more or less. This, though, was a very dangerous thing that we tried out, where the user experience people start placing requirements on the microservice team that now start building microservices with contextful purposes. And they sort of sent those up to the integration team and said, hey guys, could you slap an API on this? Yeah, that's really rendered them into creating services. We turned them into proxies. And seriously, no one want to be a proxy. It's, it's, it's not fulfilling. So we had to deal with this with our products. So setting this in our product structure, we went from project versus product setup. So what is that? Well, basically, projects, they have a start and a finish date. And that's the thing. Products have persistency. Product has a phase two often planned because it needs to fix what phase one didn't fix. Products has persistency. Uh, and a lot of documentation is going on for the project because you know some lucky bastard is going to be actually entering in phase two and he or she need to know what's it all about. Product has, yeah, you guessed it, <laughs> persistency. So. That was the thing. So previously, it looked like this. You have the responsibility on one one, and you have the other on time. And we had our first project. Time went by, and we had our second project. In between, they had a support team. Huh? Lucky bastards. Yeah, we felt lucky. They're going to manage this, right? Hopefully. This is how it looks today. We cover the responsibility with all our products. But it becomes extremely important now that the capability products are actually building capabilities. And the service products are actually building services. Because if these teams are building projects, well, you can imagine the mess. So, everything good with products then? Well, there is this word. This is the word of creating empowerment. This is the word that creates innovation. And this is actually a great word. I love it as long as it is what it says to be. In our case, it turned out to be something else. And this is not equally funny, I tell you guys. <laughs> because mandate is empowering, but responsibility is what makes it work. So, that was a trick. We are not fully past it, but we are just sort of in the end of it. 
exactly. And that's a bit what it all comes down to, is that when you're doing transformation, is that you need to do it from all different perspectives. We started from one way, we added another, but it wasn't until we started to do all the things that now it really starts to come together. So, and this is really what you should do, is you should try to find out what is relevant and what is reusable to treat everyone as a customer, because you're also serving yourself across each of these layers and um, not be driven by technology. So in a sense, um, this is what you're doing. You're creating your own world. And you want to create an environment in which you want to live in. So make sure you do it right, because you only get one. And we really love ours. Yeah, we do. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you very much.